When police find 18-year-old Katie Ratcliffe's body in an alley in 1992, the public are horrified. She'd been repeatedly stabbed and her body mutilated in an appalling and sadistic attack. Police were hunting a well-built man, likely in his mid to late thirties, due to the brutality and force of the attack. But they couldn't have been more wrong. Hello, I'm Zoe and welcome back to my channel. Today, we're talking about the case of Sharon Carr. She's notorious in Britain for being the youngest ever female killer caught and convicted. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Let's begin. Our story starts in Camberley, a picturesque town in the county of Surrey, England. It's about an hour and a half's drive southwest from London. In the summer of 1992, 18-year-old Katie Ratcliffe had just split up with her boyfriend. Katie had an apprenticeship as a trainee hairdresser, and this was something that she really enjoyed and was passionate about. Friends said that she had aspirations of owning her own salon and making this her career. But, you know, she was only 18, barely an adult. She enjoyed all the things 18-year-olds normally do, meeting friends and socialising, going out to local clubs. As I mentioned, she'd recently broken up with her boyfriend and was feeling pretty low about it. To take her mind off this, her best friend encouraged her to come out to a local nightclub, Ragamuffins, in Camberley. The girls had a good night, and for a time, Katie seemed able to forget about her worries. But when the club eventually closed, at around 4am, Katie found that she'd lost her friend. These were the days before mobile phones. Yes, unthinkable. So she did what many people have done when stranded at the end of the night out and began walking home. But she never made it. Her body was discovered the following morning, just hours later, in the alley of a side street in Farnborough. She was found partially clothed and had been stabbed 32 times in a brutal attack. Several of the wounds indicated that the perpetrator had brought down the blade with such force that it had penetrated her body completely and struck the ground underneath her. Her body also displayed signs of having been mutilated post-mortem, with her face, breasts and genitals having been viciously slashed. Katie was found in Farnborough, and that's about a 15-minute car ride from the centre of Camberley, where the girls had been in the club. Police floated the theory that she had set off walking for home, but Farnborough wasn't in the direction of her house. Had she accepted a lift from someone rather than walk home late at night alone? Had she been abducted, forced into a car against her will and driven to Farnborough? The one aspect police were fairly confident in was that they were looking for a male perpetrator. The victim's profile, Katie was a young, attractive female, and the nature and sheer brutality of the attack suggested a sexual motive. Dr. David Holmes, a criminal psychologist, said, quote, For the investigating police, Katie's death was one of mystery. However, the primary evidence, the frenzied attack, the sexuality of the attack, would point to a male, perhaps in their thirties, someone who's physically capable of dragging Katie to her final resting place. And to that effect, police constructed a profile of the suspect and began by visiting the nightclub and launching several public appeals for information. There was little to no CCTV and the few leads they uncovered didn't produce anything. The case was to remain open for two years until an event in 1994. On June the 7th, emergency services received a panicked phone call from Collingwood College, a secondary school in Camberley. One student, 14-year-old Sharon Carr, had just stabbed a fellow classmate with a knife. 
she had lured the girl, a pupil named Anne-Marie, into the toilets during break time and following a scuffle had plunged a four-inch blade into her back, penetrating her lung in the process. The victim was transferred to hospital and made a full recovery. However, she suffered from complications and severe PTSD for many, many years. Anne-Marie told police that Carr had asked her to come into the toilet block with her because she wanted her to help find a one-pound coin that she'd lost in there. Now, Sharon's reputation preceded her. She was known throughout the school as being an aggressive young woman, a bully, and someone that you didn't cross. So Anne-Marie thought she had no choice and followed her in to help her. Immediately upon entering the room, Sharon pushed her to the floor, pulled the knife from her satchel, and stood over Anne-Marie, passing the knife from hand to hand and grinning down at her. When Anne-Marie attempted to crawl away, Sharon pushed her back down and stabbed her in the back. Fortunately, a group of five girls entered the room and discovered what had just happened. Sharon stopped the attack and the girls ran for help. When the police arrived, Sharon was handcuffed and transported to a psychiatric unit for evaluation. However, when they arrived, Sharon was so aggressive that they were unable to carry out the assessment safely. She attacked two members of staff and tried to strangle them, which forced them to have her arrested and taken to a young offenders institute where she could be monitored securely. 14-year-old Sharon Carr was charged and found guilty of two counts of actual bodily harm for the attack at her school and was sentenced to two years in a young offenders institution. Sharon Louise Carr was born on December 21st, 1979 in Belize, formerly British Honduras, in Central America. Her parents were poor and she had an extremely unstable home life. Her father was an abusive alcoholic who regularly beat her mother and often Sharon and her siblings too. Her mother was an aggressive woman with a short temper who frequently took out her own frustrations on her children. Sharon recalled being burnt as well as having hot pepper rubbed into her genitals as a punishment on several occasions. From an early age, Sharon had to assume responsibility for herself. There was no one to help her, guide her, correct her, or take any interest in her whatsoever. Her parents split up when her mother met an Englishman who was stationed on an army base in Belize. And when the time came for him to transfer back to the UK, Sharon's mother decided to go with him, and Sharon was brought along too. Initially, Sharon was excited Life in England was in stark contrast from the poverty-stricken world she'd grown up in, in Belize. She had a house, she had a school, she'd even settled in and made some friends. But conversely, as she gained in confidence and began to feel more settled, she started to play up in class, misbehaving, throwing things, disrespecting the teacher and her peers. She seemed to be testing, really pushing the boundaries. And to make matters worse, she fell in with a crowd of kids that hung around on a rough estate near her home. They were known as troublemakers and they were really a bad influence on the 11-year-old girl. She was suddenly shoplifting, vandalising property, buying drugs, selling drugs. And it was said that by age 11, she was smoking cannabis every day. She started carrying weapons, knives, around with her. She would take them to school in her school bag. And then, a year after they arrived in Britain, Sharon's stepfather decided that he'd had enough and he wanted to divorce Sharon's mother. Sharon recalled later witnessing them getting into a disagreement and then seeing her mother, unprovoked, but in a fit of rage, tip a pan of boiling oil over her stepfather's head leaving him in excruciating pain and with very serious burns. Sharon herself said she wasn't shocked or scared. She didn't even move when it happened. She just stood there, watching. 
For her, this level of violence was normal. She'd grown up seeing horrendous abuse, her father beating her mother, and then her mother physically abusing the children. She was very much stuck in this cycle. And of course, this goes some way towards explaining, not excusing, but explaining why she behaved, how she behaved. Also, around this time, Sharon became very interested in voodoo. Her mother was a practitioner and told her about her own beliefs and rituals that she followed. And Sharon was keen to learn because she understood voodoo to be a way of gaining power and control over people. Carr delighted in torturing cats and dogs. Neighbourhood pets frequently went missing and the police found dozens of animal corpses, some decapitated, on a common near Sharon's home following her arrest. Back in 1994, 14-year-old Sharon is spending two years at the Young Offenders Institute for the attack at her school on Anne-Marie. During her stay, she's fairly well behaved because there's this incentive. She wants to be released after the two years are up. But it turns out she also has a big mouth. Nearing the end of her stay, she let slip to several people, including a prison guard, that she hadn't just knifed Anne-Marie. She had form, if you got her drift. And she didn't directly claim responsibility for anything, but she dropped enough hints and was specific enough that investigators took notice. And they quickly made the connection between what Sharon was alluding to and the unsolved Katie Ratcliffe case and began to delve deeper. It turned out Sharon knew several key pieces of information that hadn't been released publicly. So detectives arrested her and brought her in for questioning, hoping that she would confess to something. And as luck would have it, she was incredibly open. She talked for hours and hours giving a full account of what happened that night in 1992 and assuming responsibility for the murder of Katie. She admitted to stealing her bracelet before fleeing the scene, something that had never been revealed to the media or the public. So police were confident that she was telling the truth. Her initial version of events stated that on the evening of the 6th of June, 1992, she was driving around in a car with two men, friends of hers, but not teenagers, adult males, um, until the early hours of the morning. And just a reminder, she was 12. At 4am, most of the clubs in Camberley had shut and there were drunk people um, outside queuing for taxis making their way home. She says they saw Katie walking alone and they pulled over offering her a ride. She accepted and got into the car with the two men and 12-year-old Sharon. They continued for a while before pulling up alongside what was described as an isolated dark area on the edge of parkland. Katie, who had realised something was very wrong, managed to escape from the vehicle and started running through the park. Sharon followed her, having grabbed a knife with a six-inch blade from the car. She caught up with her and plunged the knife into Katie from behind. She stabbed her a total of 32 times in a brutal and frenzied attack. And after Katie was dead, she started to mutilate her body, slashing her face, breasts and genitalia. It dawned on her that she would need some help moving and concealing the body so she walked back to the car, only to discover that the car and its occupants were gone. So she returned to the scene of the crime and dragged Katie's body around the corner to an alleyway and left her there. And then she ran all the way home. This confession allowed police to get a warrant to search Sharon's home. And there they found her diary. It was incriminating, to say the least. It was full of disturbing writing and images. It 
talked about aspects of Katie's murder and about her future intentions to commit more crimes. She mentioned how proud she was of killing K.R. She said, quote, I was born to be a killer. Killing for me is a massive turn on and it just makes me so high. I'm a killer. Killing is my business and business is good. Psychologists said that this was probably her way of being able to retain that exhilaration she felt during the attack. She was trying to relive the high that she'd gained and these diary entries were her sort of trophy. She followed the news and knowing that the police had no leads on the Katie Radcliffe case, as time went on she felt confident that she could attempt another attack. She mentioned her intention to attack another person in the week before she stabbed her classmate in the toilets at school. According to her diary entry, she planned to draw out the attack this time and make it last longer because she, quote, enjoyed hearing Katie scream so much last time. She wrote about seeing the devil in her dreams and also looking back at her in the mirror. And that's why the press eventually labelled her the devil's daughter. Sharon was assessed by many health professionals who were unable to agree on a diagnosis initially. Eventually, she was diagnosed as suffering from schizoaffective disorder. And this is typically associated with some or all of the symptoms of schizophrenia, seeing and hearing delusions as well as violent mood swings, intense highs and depressive lows. The state had enough to prosecute Sharon for the murder of Katie Ratcliffe. However, two weeks before the start of the trial, Sharon retracted her confession, alleging that the police had coerced her and saying that she'd only confessed because she was mentally ill. In 1997, almost five years after Katie's murder, Sharon stood trial and pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Ultimately, she was found guilty of a lesser charge, manslaughter, and sentenced to 14 years in prison. During her time in prison, she continued to be aggressive. She spent a considerable amount of time in solitary confinement and was also transferred on many occasions. She ended up at Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital and while she was there, she met and almost married another patient, and that was Robbie Lane, and he had been detained for murdering his own mother. He'd stabbed and beaten her and then gouged out her eyeballs with a broom handle. They met during one of the hospital's social events and fell for each other, and subsequently were allowed to visit each other's rooms once a month under supervision. Lane proposed to Sharon Carr and they decided to get married. I looked through the old Argos catalogue. Do you remember the Elizabeth Duke range? It was sort of almost like costume jewellery and they ordered their wedding rings. But a week before the wedding, a newspaper picked up the story about the forthcoming nuptials and the couple heard about that and wanted to read the piece. Well, it seemed that both Sharon and Robbie had been rather economical with the truth when explaining why they were at Broadmoor Hospital to each other. The story laid out the full extent of their crimes and both parties were shocked and disgusted by the true histories of their fiancés. So much so, that they got up and stormed out of the room, separately, of course. The wedding was off and the rings went back. Not long after that, Broadmoor changed its structure and became a male-only facility, so Sharon was transferred anyway. And that's the end of today's case. It's certainly an interesting one. Do you have any sympathy whatsoever for Sharon? Let me know in the comments below. Her horrific childhood seemed to play a huge role in shaping her outlook on life, about needing to do whatever it took to stay alive and get out on top. 
As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps me out and gets my video promoted to a wider audience. I hope you have a great week and I'll see you again in the next one. Bye.